It was early morning on Mukajima Island on April 13th, 1612, and Sasaki Kojiro, demon of the Western provinces, was sweating. As the eastern sun beat down on the master swordsman, his gaze fixed out towards the far shore, he could detect the nervous murmurings of the small group of feudal lords behind him. The challenger was late. Perhaps something had gone wrong. Kojiro himself was not particularly worried. A large man, even for a martial artist, he must have cut an imposing figure waiting in the surf. In addition to his great stature, he carried a tremendous sword. The sword itself was legendary in its own time. More than three feet long and over 300 years old, rumor was the cutting edge was so strong and keen that it had never been chipped. Because of its great length, the sword was known as the drying pole, and Kojiro was able to wield it with ease. It was said that in his hands, it moved like a swallow in flight, changing direction with astonishing swiftness. The demon of the Western provinces had never been defeated in a formal challenge. A lifelong martial artist with an impeccable lineage, Kojiro was at the peak of his career and felt ready to face an itinerant swordsman known as Miyamoto Musashi. It was to be the last duel to the death for both men. Okay, first, this talk, <laughs> This talk contains depictions, uh, depictions of people being killed with swords. Miyamoto Musashi was the greatest sword fighter in history, winner of over 60 duels to the death, and there is no way to talk about his life while avoiding his most noteworthy accomplishments, which involve slicing and or bludgeoning people to death. I, I will say, however, that within the cultural context of the time, these deaths are as close to consensual as murder can get. Okay, one other thing. I am not Japanese. Although I've studied martial arts for many years, some of them Japanese, my skills in the language are extremely remedial. I've tried my best to correct my pronunciation, but I will doubtless make some mistakes, and for that, I apologize. I mean, no disrespect. Okay, so why are we talking about this guy? Well, it's because of this guy. That's me. I loved swords my whole life, and my parents encouraged me to explore my interests with a passion and freedom that I'm sure would be horrifying to most parents of today. <laughs> if you had asked this 11-year-old child who his heroes were, he would have answered you, and this is true, Jim Henson and Miyamoto Musashi. Yeah. So tonight, I'm going to tell you a story of his hero, my hero, and I'm going to tell you about Musashi's way to win every fight. Okay, facts first. Musashi was born, maps, thank you. Musashi was born in 1584 in the Harima province. He lived his early life in a small village called Miyamoto, which he uses for his name. He has lots of different names, but it's confusing, so we're just going to stick with Miyamoto Musashi. His father was Miyamoto Munasai. The only noteworthy things about him were two things. First, he was an accomplished fighter himself who had been granted the title of martial artist without equal under the sun. Fancy. He was an expert in the sword and the jite, which is one of these, kind of a short metal truncheon that you would hit people with. And from his father, Musashi learned the basics of holding a sword. The other thing that's interesting about Munasai is that he was terrible. Turns out that being a great martial artist and a great dad are different. <laughs> Who knew? Father and son fought often in and out of practice, and during an argument in which Munasai threw his short sword at his son, Musashi fled his house and went to live with his Zen priest uncle, never to return. Okay, to the duels. Musashi's first duel was against, uh, was against a man named Arima Kihei. Kihei was a shugyosha, a fledgling fighter on the road, roaming the countryside looking for warrior stuff to do to prove his worth to his potential employers. This was like fairly normal at the time. <laughs> Kihei posted a sign in the village square claiming to be a martial artist without equal and accepting all challengers. Musashi, seeing this, wrote a reply directly on the notice saying, a frog in the well has no knowledge of the sea. Sick burn! <laughs> Kihei was enraged by this insult. Learning the offender was simply a boy, he demanded a formal and public apology in order to spare his life. But Musashi had different plans. At the appointed time, instead of apologizing, Musashi immediately rushed to attack Kihei with a wooden stick. Kihei, seeing the boy's determination, drew his sword to strike the boy down, but Young Musashi was fast. He quickly stepped inside the length of the blade and Kihei's hand landed harmlessly on his shoulder. Musashi then thrust his arms between Kihei's legs, picked him up over his shoulder, and threw him to the ground, whereupon he savagely beat the prone warrior to death with the wooden stick that he had brought for the occasion. This was Musashi's first duel and he was 13 years old. Ice cold. 
Okay, after this, the teenage Musashi set out on the road to search for more challengers, and his attention settled on the Yoshioka clan. The Yoshioka had been sword instructors to the shogun for the past three generations, and in just three duels, Musashi would eliminate them entirely. The current head of the school was a master of Zen focus, able to disturb far off birds with just a single glance, which apparently is something you wanted to be able to do as a martial artist. I don't understand. Knowing this about his enemy, Musashi chose to disturb his opponent by arriving late and armed only with a wooden sword. Aggravated by this disrespect, the master of the Yoshiokas was unable to defend himself and Musashi knocked him unconscious with a single blow. The master immediately retired from the martial arts, leaving his younger brother in charge of the school. The new master of the Yoshiokas was a big guy who carried a wooden club with iron studs. This weapon is super heavy and requires massive strength to wield it. Imagining that, his Yoshi that this Yoshioka would be anxious to avenge his brother, Musashi chose to arrive late once again. When a nervous and vengeful master rushed at Musashi, Musashi dropped his own sword, wrested the club from his opponent's grip, and killed him with it. Crazy. The, Yoshiso the Yoshioka school was essentially dead at this point. Having lost two masters in as many days, they made a final ditch effort to preserve their honor. They installed the remaining brother, a 12-year-old boy, as the head of the school and issued yet another challenge to Musashi. This time, however, it was to be a trap. Knowing Musashi would likely be late, they prepared to make an ambush in the early morning to take the swordsman unawares. The Yoshiokas planned to bring dozens of men armed with spears, swords, bows, and even guns. But Musashi, master of strategy, would not be taken by surprise. Many years later, he would write, it is harmful to do the same thing several times in the course of combat. You can do the same thing twice, but not three times. This time, Musashi chose to arrive early. As the Yoshiokas prepared their ambush in the dawn light, Musashi stepped suddenly from behind a tree and said, did I keep you waiting? <laughs> he immediately rushed among the shocked and frozen Yoshiokas, striking down their master and many of his students in the confusion. He drew both his swords to defend himself and slipped away into the forest. And with that, the famed Yoshioka clan was no more. <laughs> Musashi continued on the life of the wandering swordsman and eventually heard rumor of a strange man named Shishido who made his own strange weapons. We know almost nothing about Shishido, he didn't win the battle, spoiler, except for his weapon, the Kusarigama, which is one of these. An eight foot chain with a weight on one end attached to a sickle on the other. This weapon was particularly good for attacking and defending against swordsmen, offering both long range and short range options. Musashi had never seen this weapon before. But as he approached the duel and Shishido began to whirl his chain, Musashi took one look, immediately drew his short sword and hurled it at his opponent, striking him in the chest and killing him instantly. <laughs> duel over. <laughs> Musashi did this, thing, this kind of thing all the time. He would throw his weapon suddenly or drop his weapon at a critical moment and seize control of his opponent's weapon. He was a master of the unexpected. Musashi began to seek opponents of a higher level, more worthy of his own skill. He set his sights on a man known as the demon of the western provinces. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, the demon of the western provinces was trained by the blind swordsman. The real blind swordsman. Odesigo was a sword master who contracted an eye disease that left him partially blind. In order to compensate, he began to develop a style using a short sword in order to draw his opponents in to where he could see them. <laughs> and thus defeat opponents who were using longer blades. As the master aged, his eyesight worsened, worsened and the length of his sword continued to decrease. <laughs> he often said, when the shortness of the sword is taken to the extreme, it becomes nothingness. His school was known as the no-sword style. Sigan took on Kojiro as a sparring partner. Even mostly blind, the old teacher could see the young man's strength. Each day, the blind swordsman, armed with only a dagger, would demand that Kojiro attack him repeatedly with much longer blades. And as the blind master tried to make his sword disappear entirely, the demon slowly learned the secrets of the long sword. After his graduation, Kojiro set up his own school called Ganrayu, or Large Rock Style. Young, ambitious, trained by legends with a nearly magical sword, he was the perfect opponent for Miyamoto Musashi. So. Musashi went to Kokoro to, to challenge Kojiro to a duel. This involved a lot of going through channels from one daimyo to another because politics, but eventually the terms were set. They chose a tiny kind of nothing island in the middle of a narrow strait. This island was mainly known for nothing, and apparently it liter Mukajima literally means island over there. <laughs> I didn't know that before this talk. Uh, Musashi seemed overjoyed that his challenge had been accepted, and yet the night, that night he disappeared from the mansion where he was staying. 
Thinking he had fled in fear, the Lord sent out messengers looking for him and found him staying with a merchant directly across the river from the island. Musashi, understanding the Lord's concerns, sent this message, which I reproduce here because it's important strategically. My Lord, I have heard that concerning tomorrow's match, you would send me in your excellency's boat, and I am heavily honored by your solicitude. However, I must strongly refuse your excellency's boat. Tomorrow morning, I will cross over to Mukajima from this place. Please do not be the least concerned and be convinced that I will come in good time. And with that letter, Musashi's winning strategy had begun. Which brings us back to here, morning on Mukajima. Kojiro and his retinue of lords and officials arrived early to the hour of the dragon, 7 a.m.-ish. But when the appointed time came, no Musashi. A messenger was sent and they found him asleep, still in the mansion where he spent the night. Musashi slowly emerged and stated that he would be along presently. He then washed his face and hands, ate a leisurely breakfast, stretched, and then borrowed an oar from the boathouse and sat down on the front steps and began to carve himself a crude wooden sword. He continually, he continued languidly in this fashion until another messenger arrived to hastily say, come immediately. Musashi, bringing his oar, went down to the shore and boarded a... Yeah. Yes, a ship! Actually, no, sorry, not a ship. It was more of a boat. But I was told I should pander because it's my first talk, so. <laughs> Having waited two hours, Kojiro finally spied Musashi's boat approaching. Incensed, he began hurling insults from the surf. Musashi carefully placed his swords in the boat, tied a towel around his head, and slowly advanced with his oar. Seeing his foes approach, the demon of the western provinces drew his tremendous sword and flung his scabbard away dramatically into the water. Musashi paused and said quietly, huh, You've lost, Kojiro. Would the winner throw away his scabbard? In rage, Kojiro rushed in, but he was far too late. Both fighters struck simultaneously, the demon's massive blade swinging down directly towards Musashi, the tip severing the knot of the towel tied above his eyes. Musashi's wooden oar, however, slightly longer, came down directly on the demon's head, felling him instantly. As Musashi advanced to confirm his victory, Kojiro revealed himself to have one final strike. Whipping his blade out to cut at Musashi's thighs, the nimble fighter leapt over the blade, and as he returned to earth, he brought his wooden sword down one final time, crushing his opponent's ribs and ending the fight completely. Still in the surf, Musashi bowed towards the witnessing officials and lords, got back in the boat, and drifted away again, never having set foot on the island. On the return home, the boatman asked Musashi why he did not take his opponent's head, as was traditional at the time. But Musashi replied that section action was for enemies. The demon was not his enemy. This was simply a comparison of techniques. <laughs> so cold. Okay, so how do you win every battle? When you study sword fighting, you learn there are only three ways a sword fight ends. You die, they die, or you both die. More than likely, every fight will be your last. Because of this, professional fighters of the time did everything they could to squeeze the margins of their advantage. Long swords, intense focus, great strength or swiftness, secret techniques and weapons. Musashi eschewed all of these ideas. He felt that the true science of the martial arts extended from, science, extended from principles that could be used in any situation. He mocked these as weak styles and would often use their preferences to destroy them. Have a long sword? He would bring a slightly longer one. Possessed of superb focus, he would rattle your cage. You see, Musashi's strength was in his lack of particulars. He depended on nothing, counted on nothing, and thus was ready for anything. He would observe his opponent and his environment and respond in an instant to his correct situation. His techniques were deeply psychological, called such things as irritating one's opponent, becoming your enemy, and imposing fear. With his keen eye and lack of reliance on anything particular, Musashi became difficult to, to attack and impossible to defeat. After his encounter with the demon of the Western provinces, Musashi lost his taste for killing. Although he continued to duel for many, many years, Kojiro's was the final life Musashi ever took. The now middle-aged Musashi realized that the people he had killed were the closest things he had to peers in all the world and the only ones who might understand him. He developed a new perspective that the master of the martial arts could dominate his opponent without bloodshed. He retired from killing, but not from dueling, fighting from this point on with only wooden swords made from whatever scraps he had at hand. Musashi also turned his eyes to less lethal arts, mastering the tea service, metallurgy, sculpture, and painting. This painting is my favorite of his. Art! <laughs> Called Hotai Watches the Cockfight, 
The Zen sate observes with mild amusement the bowing in of two roosters ready to fight to the death. The wry smile and gentle detachment in the face of such deadly outcomes befits a swordsman of Musashi's experience. Standing above and apart from the conflict, yet observing with great interest. Towards the end of his life, Musashi attempted to distill his ideas into a single work known as the Book of Five Rings. In the Earth Scroll, he condenses his practice this way. Think without any dishonesty. Forge yourself in the way. Touch upon all the arts. Know the ways of all occupations. Know the advantages and disadvantages of everything. Develop a discerning eye in all matters. Understand what cannot be seen by the eye. Pay attention to even small things. And do not involve yourself with the impractical. So I'd like to leave you tonight with a quote from the founder of Zen, which I feel describes Musashi's philosophy perfectly. It is just a vast nothingness, and nothing is sacred. So I would like to raise a glass tonight to nothing and everything that it contains. Thank you.